Well, that's sounding awfully good, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Good to be in church tonight. Good to see you here this evening. We appreciate your coming. What a great time we had in the Lord this morning. Wonderful fellowship. And hopefully our folks are going to be getting back by next week. If they don't get back, we're going to put them on the naughty list. Just want to serve notice on them tonight. Get, uh, get ready for your bag of coal if you don't get back in church. We miss our folks when they're away. It seems like every week we have families gone. And I think we need to do a yearly calendar where folks can we'll take one family at a time, can take one week, and that's it. Then you have to stay here. But we're glad that you're here tonight. We appreciate your coming and being a part of this service. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. Would you stand, please, as we pray together? Let us remember uh, Grendel Stalvey tonight. He is going to be having a liver biopsy this coming Tuesday. Also, Madison um, uh, Bryant is uh, was taken to urgent care this morning. Pray for her. Also continue to pray for Pat Jones as well as Eddie Squires. And Sharon notified me this evening that he had fallen ill. So pray God would touch him and heal him tonight. Do you have unspoken requests but lift of hand? Let's believe the Lord for these tonight. Pray for this service where the briar is preaching tonight. Pray for God's anointing upon him and upon the word tonight. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you that we can come together to worship you. Thank you for this day that you have blessed us with. Thank you for your wonderful presence that we have felt. Thank you, Lord God, for your touch upon every song, every singer, every musician. We know, Lord, without you we can do nothing. We depend upon you. We pray that you would renew our minds, renew our strength, and draw us nearer to you. Comfort those that are grieving tonight. Heal those that are sick in body. Save those who are lost. We'll praise you and give you glory for all you do. For it's in the lovely name of Jesus Christ we pray and ask it all. Amen and amen. Would you take a moment now and welcome one another? the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you with us tonight. Father standing 
Are you homesick for heaven tonight? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo, how do you follow that up? Wow. I'm homesick. I'm ready to go. I don't know about you, but, you know, this might be the last time we give our tithes and offerings because we may be going home tonight, and that'd be just fine, right? Let's worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful privilege we have to be in your house tonight, Lord. We look forward to your soon return. We look towards the, the eastern sky, and we just can't wait wait to see you up in the clouds, Lord, and see you face to face for the first time. Lord, we love you. We pray that you would take these tithes and offerings, that you would multiply them and use them for the furtherance of your kingdom. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a light in the window. And the table spread in splendor And someone standing by the open door I can see a crystal river Oh, I must be here forever, Lord I've never been this homesick before Well, I see the bright light shine It's just about home At the door, this world's in a wilderness. I'm ready for deliverance. Lord, I've never, never been this home sick before. Well, I see the bright light shine. It's just about home time. I can see my father standing at the door. I'm gay. 
Hallelujah. I know I certainly am. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, and when I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He Love the song selection tonight. I believe a lot of us are trying to get ready to leave this world. Amen. Once again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to preach God's word. I thank the pastor for the invitation. Uh, don't take it lightly. As you can see, I got a little spring in my step as I came up. I 
got four of my granddaughters here tonight, so I got good supporting cast. No matter how bad I do, I know I'll get their support, so I appreciate that. Just remain standing while I read just a couple uh, verses of Scripture. Taken in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. And it reads, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. I want to speak on just a few minutes about all these things that I believe are going to come to pass. Let us ask God's blessing on the word this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, Lord, to preach the gospel of your son Jesus. God, we thank you for the people that are here tonight, Father, and we most of all, thank you for your presence, Lord, the Holy Spirit, God, to anoint us to receive what thus saith the Lord. Father, we take authority over any hindrance, and we ask you to receive all praise, honor, and glory as we give it to you. In Jesus' name, Father God, we ask it. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I, I wanted to, I thought, uh, oh, actually it's about a month or so ago when I'd get the next opportunity to preach, I thought I'd preach something to encourage the body more differently. I wanted to go to the book of Ephesians, and I've always wanted to, to speak from that. And uh, uh, I've preached from there before, and Ephesians talks about the walk with God, the, the simplicity, the, the set in Christ, just to accept Him by grace through faith, and, and that our walk to be holy and the, worthy of the calling that He's called us. But right after Pastor last Sunday uh, asked me to hear, God took me to that particular passage of scripture what happened when Jesus said these things to his disciples this was just prior to his crucifixion so this would put the timing around AD 33 I believe not sure I don't have no uh, biblical education I only graduated from the eighth grade so I don't have much of an education so what I've read in the Bible is strictly from them so I'm not so much on historical dates but I do know what happened when Jesus gave this prophetic word, it would take place some 40 some odd years later because there's more historical evidence that tells about the destruction of the Jewish temple that the Roman 10th legion came in to Jerusalem under a, uh, the authority of a general named Titus and they completely leveled the city just like Jesus said. And it would be something to see, behold, because this was the actual temple that Jesus was in. But he prophesied that nothing would be left of it. What he was saying, remember what the Jews said when they crucified the Lord, when, when they were took it before Pilate, and they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children and upon our children's children. Now, I, the, the Jews did not crucify Jesus. They gave him to the Romans. The Romans actually did it. But the, what they did, they handed him over in jealousy. But it was all preordained. This was this from the beginning of time that God knew what it would take to redeem us. But Jesus spoke directly about this, told him what would transpire. And after that, the Jews were dispersed throughout the world. They would cease to be a nation. Just imagine we are only a little over 200 and some odd years old, 1776, through the American Revolution. That's when America was born before then. There was no America. We did not exist. We're maybe not in biblical prophecy in the end times. I don't know. What I do know is what the Bible has recorded and told us. But if we go from that date, a chain of events would start. And this would be the prophetic end times. Notice that everybody knows about what Jesus went on to say in Matthew 24. But let's, let's look at it even more closely and go from what happened to Israel at that time. Israel ceased to be a, a nation for almost 2,000 years. Now we go to the book of Ezekiel and the priest that was called in to be a prophet. He was told in the 37th chapter of his book, he talked about the Valley of Dry Bones. And I know Pastor King, Pastor Brackett have probably preached on it before. I really never have. I've never spoke on Ezekiel 38, 39 before. But 
you can't do that without 37 because 37 talks about the prophet is taken to a valley and it, he sees a great valley. He sees a valley of dry bones and the Bible emphasizes they were very dry. They were very dead. They were non-existent. There was no hope for them. It'd be just like you've seen skeletons they've discovered throughout the world. No way that those skeletons, those dry bones could live unless the breath of God would breathe on them. And Ezekiel was told, look at these people. Look at these bones. Can they live? And the prophet said, only you know, God. And he looked at him. and he said, speak to them, preach to them. And God breathed on them. And the Bible says, I think in that 10th verse, that they stood up an exceeding great army. And I'm here to tell you that man for man, the, the, the armies of Israel, the IDF it's called, it's probably one of the greatest fighting forces this world has ever known. I know from the, the, the battles that they've had, at the moment when this, I believe myself, this is me, I'm up preaching, so it's, it's my message where I'm going to say that this is describing Isaiah's prophecy in, in his book, in chapter 66. He goes on to say, can a nation be born again in a day? That's impossible. I, I don't know the exact odds, but I've heard that a, the chances of a nation being completely wiped out, done away with, and coming back to life, you could put a number in, in 50 zeros and still not get the odds. It's virtually impossible. But Isaiah said that it would be done. And when he penned that, he probably didn't know what he was speaking about. He didn't know that Romans would completely destroy Israel and scatter it throughout the world. And that prophecy came true in May of 1948. Now, I'm not quite that old. I don't know if anybody's here old enough to read or remember that. But in 1948, they came as a nation at one time with the UN Declaration. Immediately, war was declared against them on three different fronts, I believe. Maybe more. Then we can go on and we can say in 56, as a matter of fact, when I was there in 1981 and visited Israel, I, was, I got down in some trenches that the Israeli soldiers fought in 1956. Then again in 67, we all know the Six-Day War, and then another great prophetic timetable was put in place. And that was when Jesus said when Jerusalem would no longer be trodden of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles would be fulfilled. This was very significant because Israel had not regained control of Jerusalem and the holy sites. They could not go to the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall, as it's known. And I was told by a good friend of mine, Brother Rene, who I do a lot of mission work with overseas. He's a Frenchman with the Assemblies of God. And he told me, he was there in July of 1967, as a matter of fact. He was in a cave with the then President David Ben-Gurion and the Commander-in-Chief of the Israeli Defense Forces, Moshe Dayan. And they told him a story that when the Israeli paratroopers stormed the city and captured the Western Wall, that those Israeli paratroopers, they had a Jewish rabbi with them that was in the military. But they ran to the wall, and they put their two hands on the wall, and they looked to the sky because they thought Messiah was coming then. That's how prophetic this nation of Israel is. And I put something in my notes that I, I wanted to say. I, I see, I follow a man named Amir Tassadi. He's a Messianic Jew. Gives a lot of information. But he's been showing all over the world the churches that stand with Israel. But again, I told you, I don't have an education, so I don't have a church background. But what little I do have, reading the Bible, and I'm being very serious when I say this, I don't see how a Christian couldn't be a supporter of Israel. Why? God didn't choose the Americans or the Italians or the Greeks or the Romans. He chose the Jews. That his son would be sent. He, he chose a Jewish maiden named Mary. And he sent his son through the tribe of Judah. Both Joseph 
and Mary can be traced back through the tribe of Judah and the nation of Israel. He was the king of the Jews. Simply put, if I'm a Christian, wouldn't I not follow everything that he did? But yet, I, I was baffled one time. He was an elder, and he's actually related to me, a cousin, and he's a minister. He's retired now. But he spoke, and he talked about he's not sure he supports the nation of Israel. Now, understand this. I don't support everything they do. They got a lot of leftists over there. They've got a Jewish man that has an alternative lifestyle. So I don't agree with him either. And the nation of Israel as a whole is secular. They're not, they're not worshipers of the God of Abraham. They're a very secular nation. Nonetheless, one thing I remember about Scripture, he would take away their idols from them. They don't worship idols anymore. They might not be worshiping the God. And I'm reminded of what Jesus said when he looked over the city just when he made that Olivet Discourse. He looked over the city of Jerusalem and he, he said and he cried, Thou that killest and stonest the prophets, how often I would have come unto you and have took you underneath my wings, but you would not. And he told him, You won't see me again after this time. After I go, you won't see me again. Do you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord? And I can tell you this, Zechariah, the prophet that he was, he saw this time. He saw in the future from his time, he said, at that day, I believe the end of the tribulation period, he said, in that day, he said that he shall stand upon the Mount of Olives and it will be split. When? When Jerusalem will be half taken. So let me stop here again and say about as a defender of Israel, as a believing in the God of Israel. They can't be defeated. They won't fall. Jerusalem will never fall. Zechariah says it will be half taken. Not all, but only half. And at that moment, then, they will cry and say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They will realize that the Messiah had come and they'd rejected him. And that's when I believe that he will come the second time and stand on this earth. He'll return in the same place that he left on the Mount of Olives. And he will establish his rule. He'll set up his kingdom. And guess who sits at the, on the throne of Israel? David. Listen, if we as Christians could not be wholeheartedly behind Israel, we couldn't be really Christians. But Ezekiel talked about the Valley of Dry Bones. But he went on to something else, and this is what really stirred in my spirit. In Ezekiel chapter 38, I believe it is. I want to read this because this, this excites me. Like I said, I've never preached from this before. But the Lord just took me to this. And first of all, I just, again, I want to say I've got Pastor King, Pastor Brackett here. I don't know if they've spoke on this before or how they feel about this. I've never talked to them about it. Don't know when the battle of Gog and Magog takes place. It hasn't taken place yet. But all the players are in place. When I just recently took a trip, as I was taking it, I know, remember my son that's been sick, and thank you all, incidentally. Everyone that's asked about my son prayed for him. Thank you so much. I know there's a lot of people with just as urgent needs here that have prayed for my son, and my uh, prayer is that God return your prayers back a hundredfold towards you. So I thank you so much for that. But I remember his wife and I were getting ready to leave. My son called me because we'd be gone for about a week. He said, Dad, when are you going to return? Because he was concerned about what we'd do for work when he got back, when I got back. And I remember distinctly, and I was serious. I said, Son, if I get back. He said, What do you mean, Dad, if you get back? I said, son, the Lord could come back before I get back. And the reason I felt so strongly about it is the United Nations just had announced that they were going to have a meeting of 193 nations, I believe, 73, I'm not sure the exact number, but it was a discussion on a seven-year security peace treaty. And then they invited Israel on the Saturday just as I left. I, I looked at my wife and I told her, Hollywood couldn't write this script any better. It looks like everything has fallen into place. But Ezekiel 38 is something special. Just let me share it with you. I hope you'll get what I got from it because it excites me every time I look at it. Ezekiel 38, verse 1, and it says this. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, 
Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against them. And say thus, saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee. Let me read that again. Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, thou chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now this could be, they say, Moscow, Turkey, Russia, I mean, uh, Iran, uh, Persia, as I go on a little bit, it's named. So let me, let me read it, then I'll go back. It, it says, And I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth all thine army, horses and horsemen, all them clothed with all sorts of armor, even as a great company with bucklers and shields, all them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, and all them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, and the house of Togomor of the north, quarters and all the bands and many people with them. Be thou prepared and prayer, prepare for thyself. Thou and all thy company that are assembled with thee and be a guard unto them. And then he says in verse 8 and after many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years thou shalt come into this land. But the thing that I want you to see here I want you to see the possibility of this. If Gog and Magog, if the battle of that battle is the one to precede the rapture of the church, how close are we? I just saw tonight on Newsmax before it came a little disclaimer that came over and said that Turkey and Iran have united against their stand against Israel. Russia's already, they've got it like a trilateral commission there together. The three main players are right there ready. Everything is in place. But I, I want you to, church, I want you to know this. If this takes place before the rapture of the church, we're going to see some great and mighty things before he catches us up. And I'm going to tell you what. I just read, he said, behold, I'm going to put a hook in their jaw and I'm going to make them come. Let me give you a modern translation of that. God is going to say to Israel, I mean to Iran, to Turkey, to Russia, to all the other countries that are against Israel, I'm going to bring you down and I'm going to make you fight, my people. But they're not going to fight. I'm going to fight for them. You think about that. Hailstones is going to fall out of the sky. Supernatural. It doesn't say that the Israeli army will fight. It says that God will fight for them. Think about this, and I want you to really understand if he does this before the rapture, what more of a sign would you need to be to be ready? To be make sure that you're right before the Lord. To make sure that we could go and testify to our loved ones. Behold, he comes, look and see the great God and what he's doing to the enemies of God. I'll bring them down. And he's going to do it for one reason. I'm going to show them that I am the God. That there is no God beside me like he declared in Isaiah. Even hundreds of years ago he told that prophet, Beside me there is no Savior. I am the Lord thy God. He declared, I am that I am. He even said that to the Pharisees. And they didn't understand what he said. Or if they did, they got angry with him. Because how dare he say and compare himself to God. You know, that's why I always got a kick out of the women that the men that caught the woman in very act of adultery and they brought him before the master. And they were quoting the law to the lawgiver. They didn't realize who they were speaking to. They didn't realize who they were crucifying because they did, they'd have never crucified the Lord of glory. But he looked, he had the compassion. That's what we as Christians, maybe we lack that same kind of love. Speaking to myself also. Would we say, Father, forgive them but they know not what they do, especially the ones that hit him. Say, prophesy unto us who hit you and beat him to an inch of his life. The average man would have died from that beating. Jesus had to be a pretty good man in his own right, a natural man, because he felt all the pain, all the sorry. I've even heard that what he probably died of was a broken heart because he had never been separated from the Father. The only reason he was separated from the Father was because of you and I. It took the greatest prize that God had his only begotten son it's the only way that we could purchase our salvation because all our righteousness no matter who it is whether it's the pastor right on down to the least of us would be as filthy rags before him but I'm excited to know that God is going to be bring them down it's going to make them fight going 
to make them have war against the nation of Israel. And look at, look at right now, everything evolves around it. The whole world is in chaos over this one little town, country I mean. And then take Jerusalem. He says in Zechariah, I'll make it a cup of trembling. For some reason they want to give it back to the Palestinians. They say it was Palestine. And I've heard John Hagee preach it very much. It's the only country in the world mandated by God. But I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that its boundaries was from the Euphrates all the way to the Mediterranean. Everything was given to them. They haven't fulfilled that. And let me tell you another thing that I don't believe in. I don't believe in replacement theology either. I don't believe the church at any time has ever replaced Israel. I believe Israel will sit at the head just like the Bible says. He will come. He will establish after the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe he will set up his throne in that temple in Jerusalem. He'll rule for a thousand years. And the reason why I don't believe we're going to go through tribulation, because if we're here during tribulation, we are a pre-trib, uh, excuse me, pre-tribulation rapture church. That's what we believe. That's what the church of God believes. That's what I believe. We believe because if not, we would know the two witnesses come. Whether they're, I know one's Elijah because the Bible says it'll be Elijah. Whether it's Enoch, Moses, whoever the second one is, doesn't matter. If I'm here and I see that, I can tell you exactly when the second coming will happen, when Zechariah 14 would take place. But we, we you know, we, we've got to where we, we think that Israel is not, doesn't play an important part, the church doesn't, that we've replaced them, but somehow God has cast them off. Even Paul had to deal with it in his day. Has God cast Israel off? He said, God forbid. But we're always looking for, for someone to, or something to replace the emptiness that, that God has put out there when he, when he sent his son into this world. But I, I believe that we're on the threshold of the coming of the Lord. I, I've wanted to preach something else, but for 33 years, that's what God continually pounds in my spirit. But you know, some of us, that's what we're set for. You know, I had to sit and I had lunch with my wife after church this morning and, and she was bragging on pastor's message again and saying how good he is and how prepared he is and all the, the, the things that he puts up on the screen and I'm very impressed with him too, so I'm confessing that. But you know what? There's only room for Pastor King. He's just a different type preacher than Pastor Brackett. I, I love hearing both of them. For me to be up with these men, it's an honor and a privilege for me. I couldn't preach like either one of them, but you know what? I'm not supposed to. I'm supposed to give the body what he wants me to give. And what I'm to give is an encouragement to the body. Whether it, it, listen, like Pastor said, there's a lot of them that's gone. Listen, myself, I probably getting way, to go away here a, a few times now here in the next few uh, weeks or so. We have our general convention in Houston, Texas. We'll be leaving right after Christmas. I'll probably be gone for a week or two, and then I've got other places I need to go. So when I'm not here, trust me, if I'm not in church here, I'm in church someplace else or I'm where I can't be. But I believe that we're talking to the faithful now. We're talking to ones that we need. But the Bible says we're called to encourage one another. We're called to bear one another's burden. That's why I'm so appreciative of this church and the prayers that I received from my son. We were in literally almost a month. We were a couple weeks up in Pittsburgh. Now, that's where I'm from, but we were downtown Pittsburgh where I'm not from. And we, we had to change motels at least six or seven times. And the, the cost that it was, it was just unbelievable the, 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 the time that we had up there. Then we got home only a day and a half, and he had to go right back in the hospital. But, I, you know, as pastor preached this morning, he said, and, and, and they'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And that's what I believe with the word of God. You know, I've got everything to, to, to believe. I've got nothing to lose by trusting in God. I'm trusting that God will not only heal my boy's kidneys, but he'll save him. You know, I had a good friend of mine, a pastor from Spire, Oklahoma, call me and reminded me about the 10 lepers. Those 10 were all healed, but there was one, just one of the 10 that came back and fell down and he worshiped at the master's feet. And Jesus said, go thy way, thy faith 
have made thee whole. That word should have been translated better. Your faith has saved you. Just like Paul said, grace through faith. That's what saved the man. God's unmerited favor and his grace and his mercy. That's what this walk with the Lord's all about. It's by faith. I have never felt or seen God with my natural hands or natural eyes. But what do I lose? What possibly can I lose by believing every word of this book as I do? If I live and die and go to the grave, I have lost nothing. But boy, if every word is true, in my Father's house are many mansions. I call it the greatest promise in the Scripture. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And he said, if it wasn't true, I wouldn't have told you. That promise is to us and to as many that are as far off, to whosoever will. I, on my father's gravestone, I put these words from John 6. Whosoever come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. That covers everybody. Dad didn't ask me what my last name was. Dad didn't ask me the color of my skin. Dad didn't ask me what ethnic background I had. Dad didn't ask me anything. It said whosoever. That's how inclusive our God is. He's a God of everyone. He's a God that if we just whisper his name, Jesus, he's there. He's so, his name is so powerful. The apostle Paul said that he was given a name that was above every name. Now, Jesus was a common name in his day. Just like my name in the 50s was a common name, John. The most popular name at that time I've, I've read. But Jesus was a common name of his day. But it's when we say Jesus. When we say it as he's the son of God. You know, I've, I've done got in trouble with a lot of people because making a statement about the law and everything else. But I, I want there to be no mistake on what I believe. I believe this Bible is the infallible and God-breathed word that every word is true and every word we're accountable to. I believe that Jesus Christ was the sinless, spotless, only begotten Son of God. And I believe that there's no other name given unto men whereby we're saved except the name of Jesus. I won't compromise that. I won't, no matter what the church of God might do, I'm still baffled. When the church of God, there's 380 some odd ministers that couldn't call God the Father and Jesus his son. That seems impossible, but that's the compromise that's coming to our church. When I say church, I'm talking about the church universal, to whosoever will. We can't back up from the word of God. We can't compromise to the devil because every inch we give him, he wants more and more and more. Jesus said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was the same one that said, come unto me and I will in no wise cast you out. Come with your burdens and your labor and I'll give you rest. He's the same one that, that, that told the multitudes and fed them. Some when they didn't have no more food, I said they didn't follow him no more. But the, the bread that he gives is the bread of life, the manna from heaven. That's the bread that we should seek. That's the bread that we should desire. I, my hope and prayer, and I'm so glad, to, again, the wife and I said, we're so glad that God placed us here at Matthew's Church of God in these last days that I know when I do go, a lot of times my family are not able to go. I know they're here among family and friends in a house of God where a preacher preaches the gospel without compromise and preaches what thus saith the Lord. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for all of you for your support. And again, I don't take it lightly to preach what the Lord has gave me. I, listen, I'm not a long-winded preacher. I don't do much, but I want to be obedient to the Lord. And I'm going to ask all that will to come down to these altars. I want to pray for us as a body. Everyone that will right now, I want you to come. Pastor King, I wish if you would come up because I want to pray mainly for you and, and Pastor and the body, all our elders that are present. This is what the Lord showed me what to do. And I always like to be obedient. The Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of righteous people availeth much. If your blood bought, 
then you avail much when we pray. Like I said, God doesn't look on the outside appearance. He looks on the heart. That's what I like about this God. He's a God without compromise and a God without prejudice. As I begin to pray, I want everyone to pray. Pray this. I've got unsaved loved ones. I know some, all of us probably do. Let's pray for them. I want to pray for the pastor, Pastor Brackett, Sister Brackett, Brother and Sister King, the elders and their wives. As we pray, let's just beseech the throne of heaven for God's Holy Spirit to fall upon us right now as I lead us. Heavenly Father, right now, God, in the name of Jesus. And Father God, as I lay hands upon the pastors, God, and Father, I believe that thou art God and beside you there is no other. And Father, I pray our hedge of protection around all these people that have come on these altars, God. And Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit begin to move. And Father, if they have prayed for my son's healing, God, now I begin to call upon their needs. God, those that need a healing, as his name is Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. Jehovah Jireh, the God that sees and provides. God, I pray that you meet the needs of this congregation, Lord. Father God, I pray that you move up and down the midst of this altar, God. That you begin to bless and sanctify, set apart for the master's use. And Father, I take the authority that I have in the name of Jesus. And I rebuke the devourer. I bind the devil in the name of Jesus. I speak authority over him and every device that he has to be recognized. And I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon this body of believers. Father, to touch, to minister. Father, according to your will and to your word. And for God, for everything, I'll be careful to give you praise, honor, and glory. For I ask it all in Jesus' precious name. If you believe that, give the Lord a hand clap of praise as Pastor comes. go. Appreciate the message and the messenger tonight. Thank you, Brother Breyer. Good to have your family with us tonight. Amen. We appreciate them coming. Reminding us once again that we're on the brink of the coming of the Lord. People have heard it and heard it and heard it. Peter said, they said to him, where is this promise of his coming? We've heard this. He hasn't come yet. There's a lot of people that have dismissed the coming of the Lord. But Peter said the only reason he hasn't come is because he's long-suffering. That was almost 2,000 years ago. How much nearer are we to the coming of the Lord tonight? Be ready, be looking up, be praying. Praying for the lost that God would convict their hearts. The Lord wants to save them. You will we'll pray and say, God, save them. It's not a matter of him saving them. He wants to save them. But we need to pray that they'll be so convicted they'll want to be saved. They'll call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Praise God for the word tonight. I tell you, the music was wonderful tonight. Amen. It's good to see a. Music minister, work up a sweat. Amen. Brian got into it tonight. He felt it tonight. Amen. You're happy here, aren't you? Very happy. Tanya, you're happy here, aren't you? What a great tandem we have here. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're so glad to have them and our music team. I believe we're going to keep moving forward till the Lord comes. He has blessed us and he's getting us ready and he has given us the cream of the crop and we thank the Lord for that. Would you stand? We'll be dismissed. Again, it's good to have you that are visiting with us tonight. Don't forget there will be service Wednesday night here for our Bible study in chapter 19 of Revelation. And then, of course, the choir is going to be practicing. They're getting ready to go to Billy Graham on Friday night. We're singing there. It's a privilege.
to be invited there to sing. I think this year they gave them a little extra uh, room to sing in as well. I think they're throwing in a meal as well. So that's pretty good, isn't it? It's going to really represent our church well. So pray for them. God will bless them. We start off a brand new month this week, next Sunday, month of December. And as you know, that month goes by so quickly. So don't miss out. We've got our children working real hard on their program in just a couple of weeks, a few weeks, and then the choir, choir will be doing something the second uh, week in December. So that'll be here before you know it. Good to see the temples here tonight. I'm going to ask Brother Matt Temple if he will please to dismiss us in prayer. <laughs> 